I knew that I wanted to be an architect from probably the fifth or sixth grade, and Virginia Tech had one of the best schools, uh, certainly in the state, and certainly one of the best ones in the country. And that's really what persuaded me to come here. And it turned out that uh, even though at the time I had no idea what architects really did, uh, it was a great choice. I stayed, I was in Vauder Hall. My parents helped me unload my worldly possessions. They took me and my roommate out to dinner and they left and came back five years later when I graduated. <laughs> so they were not helicopter parents. Actually, I helped to organize the first Earth Day. And we had meetings in Washington and whatever else. And uh, it was in the early stages of kind of enhancing the awareness of the environment and the interconnectivity and ecological systems. And so I participated in putting together the program that was rolled out nationally. And I suspect I still have a file in the FBI for doing that. <laughs> but it was a very good experience for me. Well, I, I'm a firm believer in liberal education in the sense that it enables people to learn how to think critically, to understand the evolution of the values of Western civilization. And uh, it was just always a subject that fascinated me. And in, the reality was it was tremendously valuable in helping me to understand what was going on in architecture. Well, one of the key things that is critical to being a, an effective designer is the capacity to recognize patterns in complex situations where there is a, a large number of variables and a sort of high uncertainty. And you have to learn how to sort through, you know, what is important at what point in time in what particular project. And that's how you develop your intuitive skills, you know, to have an informed intuition as a designer and to be able to bring a certain creative perspective of thinking about things in different ways. And I use that every day. Uh, we are confronted with all kinds of problems and probably one of the contributions that I can make, if I make any, is to think strategically uh, about what's going on and also to think creatively about ways to solve the problems that we've not approached before. I like to see the progress and the excitement that students have in terms of really learning how to think. And I've had notes that it's really one of the most interesting and rewarding things that I've gotten from former students. And the note could be three or four years later where they said, this is a quote, I finally figured out what you were talking about. <laughs> so it's a, great, it's a great pleasure to see them grow and develop. And as you are helping them, their questions and insights help you to grow and develop your own thinking. So it's a kind of a symbiotic process. It's a, that's the key experience of being in the university. It took about two and a half years to get that done. There was a lot of controversy about buying a villa in Switzerland and whatever else. Uh, but over with some perseverance and a lot of help, a lot of help from my friends, as they say, uh, we were able to do that, and it continues to thrive today. But fundamentally, I think for people to understand and be able to operate in today's global society, they have to be able to understand other cultures and learn how to see and to think from the perspective of other people in the world. And this type of immersion travel experience uh, lets them see the world in a way many, many of our students never imagined or never experienced before. So that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. 
in order to continue to sustain the momentum of the institution, we have to have the private philanthropy. It does a lot of things. One, the scholarship money enables a lot of young people to come to Virginia Tech who have the ability, but not the financial means, uh, to do so. And many, many, I've seen generations of them now go out and they're just extraordinary members of society. So it makes possible the realization of their hopes and aspirations. It also gives us an opportunity to do new things that within the regulatory constraints of the state would never happen. Virtually everything we do that's innovative is done with private money. The European Studies Center you just referred to would never have happened without the Virginia Tech Foundation. The new research center in Arlington would never happen. The Performing Arts Center would never happen. I could go on and on and on. There are over 250,000 living alumni now have great affection for the university. And our task uh, in terms of the fundraising part is to ensure that they understand and share the vision of where we're going and that we are able to understand you know, what really touches their heart, what do they really care about. Because people generally, the donors, they want to give. This is not something you persuade, you know, you don't force people to do it. They want to do it. What is happening today is that there's an increasing bimodal distribution of institutions in America. The strong are getting stronger at an accelerating rate, and there's a big gap being formed. Now, we're in the top group. We're sort of at the bottom of the top. Um, but because of the uh, information revolution, organizations that want research or scholarship or whatever can go anywhere in the world to get it, and they do. And so you have to ensure that you have some collection of world-class programs, which we do. Uh, and the rest, there's a halo effect on everything else. And the reason that you need to grow the resources is that the ability to access participation in these major research projects and whatever else, the capital costs for new equipment are going up astronomically. Uh, the cost of facilities, everything, you know. And if you don't have that critical mass of resources, then you are simply left out. I try to keep up with what's going on in the world. I read a lot. And I try to think about, to get past the sort of, you know, the immediate crises of the day and think about the long-term factors that affect society and the role the university plays in relating to those. And I do spend a lot of time thinking about it. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm not. But, uh, but over time, uh, that's how you shape the vision. Uh, obviously, you have to have ideas that have some merit. Those ideas have to be shared. And yes, you have to be tenacious. <laughs> I don't give up easily. Well, it's something I can't explain quite why that I've always valued throughout my whole life. But as I began to learn more about pedagogy, et cetera, uh, being able to develop m the multi dimensions of the human intellect in terms of experiential learning and developing a sense of aesthetics, and I'm not talking about a superficial thing, but it's a a different way of thinking and judging the world are complementary to the logical deductive reasoning that we generally employ and what's taught in our schools and whatever else. And if you can provide this broad set of experiences and new ways of thinking and experiencing the world, you produce a much more uh, inquisitive and effective individual who's a better thinker. And that's why I'm committed to it. it. It doesn't matter whether it's English literature or painting or whatever else. It's the ability to think and reason in a different way. That's what's important about it. Well, I, I think when I see the growth and development of our students while they're here, 
and particularly when I see what they are accomplishing as alumni and the contributions they make to society, whether they're doctors or lawyers or teachers or farmers, all these things. Uh, they, they are extraordinary people. And I also look at the tremendous contributions our faculty make in terms of guiding those students through their advising, in terms of their research, in terms of the uh, problems that society faces that they help resolve. Uh, all of those things are, are very important. And as I noted, we've got projects in 44 countries around the world going on today, and they're dealing with helping communities uh, have enough food to eat solving the water quality problems that eliminate river blindness. And, you know, these are tremendously valuable things. And we've got people who help invent new materials, who help the space program, you know. The uh, sun never sets on the Hokie Nation, you know. Well, I would be hesitant to name any single individual because I would leave out a lot of wonderful people. But I've been very fortunate to work with some extraordinary people, members of our board, alumni, and others. And I try, uh, when I can, to observe how they operate and how they think and how they make decisions and how they relate to other people and how they articulate their vision and issues and concerns. And so, um, I've considered myself very, very lucky to have known some of the very major business and political leaders in the United States and indeed some around the world, and I try to learn what I can from each of them. Well, when I came as a student, there were only 7,000 students. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were a good regional institution, very good. And you know, now we are a very good national and international institution, and that is from tremendous effort and contributions by all the thousands of people who make the place operate every day and all the wonderful alumni who set wonderful examples for our students, contribute their resources, and particularly their enthusiasm and commitment to the future of the institution. So we're not the same place. The other place was great. But this is a, it's a different university than it was then. Well, I'm very optimistic about the future of the university. I think that there are going to be a lot of significant challenges for higher education in America over the next five to ten years. Uh, I cannot forecast what they will be. But I think we have put in place an organization with the quality of people who have the capacity to innovate and to respond to these changing problems. And uh, we, will, we will do well in the future. In fact, we will do very well.